Hi, my name is Marianne Opes. I'm a complex abdomen specialist at Regents Hospital, which is a level one trauma center in St. Paul, Minnesota. And this is my YouTube channel. It's called complexwounds.com. And we have a whole bunch of different YouTubes on there, videos that you can learn how to do things like with complex fistulas, uh, bad ostomies and complicated wounds. And so today we're gonna to talk about something a little bit different, a little more on the surgical side, called direct peritoneal resuscitation. It's something that came out of the East Association of Surgery and Trauma a couple of years ago, and we find it very helpful. We tweaked how we do it a little bit. And so I'm going to go through the steps of how that is done. And so I hope you guys enjoy that. Direct peritoneal resuscitation is something that is fairly new, and it's actually instilling fluid into the abdomen after devastating injury with the use of a device called the Abthera, which is a negative pressure system with a visceral protection layer that you can put directly over the bowel. And you're probably wondering why we would ever want to do this. It's for open abdomen patients, trauma patients that have hemorrhagic shock, acute care surgery patients that have bad infections. Like we have a patient right now at our hospital that had necrotizing pancreatitis, anyone that has significant bowel edema. And what it does is it uptakes fluid, it normalizes electrolytes faster, it reduces the inflammatory cytokines, it helps to vasodilate the ischemic bowel, even when the patient's on vasopressors, which I think is amazing. It maintains mesenteric perfusion and it reduces tissue injury. And I want to say it's not on the screen, but it also increases blood flow to the liver. So definitely a lot of really important factors about this. It definitely also in literature and in, in our experience reduces the time to abdominal closure. It has higher closure rates, decreases the Apache scores, decreases the ICU severities, and it may re reduce the risk of fistula formation just because you are getting that abdomen closed faster. Here's a case of a pedestrian that was ran over by a truck at work. You can see he's got open abdomen, he had compartment syndrome, and he had the placement of the temporary abdominal closure, which the brand name is called Abthera. So the Abthera comes in a couple of different pieces. This one that looks like a starfish is the visceral protection layer, and that goes directly over the bowel. It can be trimmed. And then the next piece is that oval looking blue foam, which just sits uh, on the top of the visceral protection layer, slightly tucked under the edge of the skin fascial area. And then you have drape where you actually drape over that foam connected to a negative pressure system. And then to the, in this case, the Ulta pump, which is, a, this is all 3M KCI products. So back to our patient, three prior washouts with this temporary closer system. And this is generally what it looks like when you have the Abthera in place. It's usually fairly concave and you can see the edges. Unfortunately, this gentleman had this situation going on. So his ball was very edematous. We did not do direct peritoneal resuscitation at this time, because this is a couple of years ago, but you can imagine that closing this patient is going to be really difficult. So sometimes we would do things like use an abdominal closure system, which is a system that goes transfascially up and over the bowel, uh, which is protected by a silicone barrier sheet, and it connects to these little buttons on either side. So it's almost like a little bit of a corset. So this is what it looks like in real life. So you can see that the elastomers are the white pieces of string that looks like coming through. We have the silicone layer covering the bowel. And then that thing that we call it the gooseneck, it's where you place your elastomers so they don't slide side to side. The button anchors are the only thing that hold these in place. So there is quite a bit of pressure on the skin. And from a wound care perspective, I was a little like, oh gosh, but we do find that the skin actually does okay. We do have IOBand over the entire thing first, which is antimicrobial and does actually help to take care of the skin as well. And then what you're seeing on the last picture is the surgeon is doing what we call the move. So after you put these elastomers on, you kind of hold lateral tension kind of tightly and then retighten your elastomers all the way from top to bottom. And so this move also happens when they are not in the operating room. So every day we go back and we will give them the move and retighten our elastomers. Every other day we need to change the negative pressure system that sits over the top of the gooseneck and on top of this uh, silicone layer. And we do the move bedside and then tighten the elastomers to two times the tension. And it's hard to see on um, these, but there's little black lines on the elastomers and 
you want them to be two times what they are normally. And that's how we figure out the tension. The tension. And then what we found was we don't overfill these cavities with vac foam like you would for a normal wound. We actually do a thin layer and we call it thin to win, which just helps us to bring in the fascial edges. And then obviously we use lower pressures on the vac. We're not trying to heal anything. We're just trying to hold all these pieces in, in place. How we decide when it's time to close the patient is we do fascial measuring every time we change the vac. You can see each time we do it and we do the move, we pull the edges together till it's about one to two centimeters, and then we can close the, the wound. Once we do that, we this is the fascia on this inner edge that you can see I'm going through, and we reuse the elastomers to kind of hold or bolster the fascia, kind of like old-fashioned retention sutures, but we do it internally, and then we take them out at about three to four weeks. And you can see all the different sutures where we're bringing fascia together and, and skin edges. Then we keep them open after we've got fascia closed and we put them in an installation negative pressure system and keep them in this installation system until tissue has grown completely over the sutures. And that way they don't usually need any debridement and they close quite nicely. And this is our patient and just a couple of days later. And here he is back at clinic. And he said, he's back to his hairy self, which makes me laugh. That's how we used to do the abdominal closures that were difficult. And the reason we use all this methods and why we're using direct peritoneal resuscitation is because of this nice gentleman. He doesn't look so bad laying down or standing, looking at you. But when you look at him from the side, you realize that without the fascia closure, this abdomen will just keep stretching. Back to the direct peritoneal resuscitation, we're going to go through an application video in just a second, but we really wanted to make this work for our providers as well and the nurse's bedside. So we actually made a direct peritoneal resuscitation order set that goes through how to do this, how much fluid, how to run the fluid, that kind of thing. So it's just an example of our Epic order set. The products that we're going to be using in this demonstration are the 3M Abthera Advanced Open Abdominal Dressing, the VAC Ultra Therapy Pump. We actually get 1,000 milliliter canisters when we do this because you run between 200 and 800 cc's an hour into the abdomen. So that's a lot of, of it coming back out into the canister. We found that we have to have the add to catheter adapter, which you'll see as a little blue adapter that everybody has in their hospital, but nobody knows the name of it. And then we use the Baxter dialysis, low calcium with hypertonic solution so that we're actually pulling the edema out. And then obviously IV administration sets, and we use 19 French Blake drains. So putting this together, we have the diacylate here and we cut it at about six inches from the tubing that is pre-attached. And then you're gonna add your IV tubing at this point. You can't have your IV tubing up here. It doesn't fit. It has to be in this section. And this little guy, we're gonna crack. This is the adapter that goes from the IV tubing to the Blake drain. That's super important to have that. Otherwise it falls apart and goes all over in your bed. And then, like I said, we have to snap right here. That breaks or opens the flow of the fluid into the tubing. So this is what it looks like all together. This is also with the Ranger uh, fluid warmer in tow. So you can see you can go from the fluid through the tubing through your ranger if you want to warm it if your patient is cold and then into the patient this is the blank drain and this is what it looks like set up in one of our patients stuff that's important is do not stop the abthera while this infusion is going which totally makes sense because you don't want to add a bunch of fluid and not be able to take it out definitely watch peak airway pressures and bladder pressures we do them bladder pressures usually every one hour at least for the first couple hours and then sometimes we can back off to like every two hours stop if there's frank bleeding in your canisters and they fill quickly these canisters and so you might want to order them ahead of time overnight sometimes it's kind of hard to get that kind of stuff we plan for about 72 hours on this therapy and then we decide if we're going to do it again so that's about 28 bags of diacylate so just think of that when you're getting your bags to we just put them on a big cart and send them outside the room the references for the EAST protocol that we talked about are here. So if you're looking to start this in your facility, 
you can pull these off the internet and show them to your people. Okay, so let's get to that video application. This is Dr. Adam Shika showing us how he places the lake drains into the pericolic gutters deeply along the sides of both sides of the patient. And this is a model of an open abdomen. You can see that this is a loops of bowel and the liver is sitting there at the top. And you can see he's bringing the drain through the top of the patient rather than out the sides like in the East protocol. He's going to trim the abthera dressing so it fits the patient. Sometimes you have to trim quite a few of these little foamies off, but you want to trim it so that when you are done trimming, you pull that foam out because that way you never have to worry about foam touching any of the ball, which could cause problems because that visceral protection layer is there to actually protect the ball. So now we have to run the, and this is something Adam actually figured out. He runs the drain through the, the inner part of the spider looking visceral protection layer, like right through it. That kind of keeps it in place when he tucks in. So you don't want to do it through the foam, but actually through the piece between. So it's coming out the top, which is, this is different than the East protocol. And that's why we're making this video. Then he's gently tucking in the foam dressing over the top. Like I said, a couple of centimeters underneath the edge of the skin fascial layer. He's going to take his drape and place it over the top of that. We do like to add picture framing around the edges. He makes a little anchor point with the tape so that the drain doesn't get pulled free. He's then going to picture frame all the way around the entire wound, just like always when we do our back dressings. It really helps to provide a leak proof system. And he's going to drape the entire thing. He's very fast. <laughs> Take off number two. And then he likes to put his negative pressure um, track pad at the base. He cut a nice big hole for it. And then he's going to deploy that negative pressure. This is how he makes sure that he has no leaking around this little drain itself. He does like a two layer system. And then we can hook that drain in the operating room. We'll hook it to a JP bulb just to get him to the ICU. And then he's just showing you how he makes sure that he wants to have it lifted off the skin level a bit so you don't cause any injuries on the skin level. And then he's showing here that he's just going to clamp that drain and send him back to the ICU with it clamped. Or you can put on a JP bulb, whichever you prefer. But it's just very important that you actually label that drain prior to going out of the OR. And then he's showing you how he's using the little blue adapter, which is what hooks into the IV tubing. And then you don't get a, a leak, which is really nice. This is the peritoneal dialysis solution that we use. And it comes with tubing. We kind of went through some of this already. Most of this tubing you're just going to throw away. So he's cutting the tubing at about the six inch mark. We kind of talked about that because you're actually going to put your IV anchor into that, that six inch mark. And then to make sure that your little blue adapter doesn't leak, we use the chest tube banding gun. And then you're just going to take your IV tubing and you can actually spike it into the, the tubing for the peritoneal diacylate. You don't want to crack your little green area first because the fluid will start running. So you want to make sure you put your IV tubing, you spike your IV tubing into the diacylate tubing first. And it does go in there pretty nicely. And then you can crack your little green access to the fluid. He's showing here how he's now hooking up the lure lock into your little blue adapter. That's the key to this whole process to make sure that it doesn't come apart. Because believe me, we had a couple different ones that at first came apart, but now we have our system down. And then he's going to label it um, DPR which is super important, especially if you're coming out of the OR without the systems all hooked up, because a lot of times we'll do all the hookup in the ICU. And then he's just cracking his little green, I don't know what you call that little green thing, but he cracks it. And then it's just like anything else, you're just gonna prime your tubing and put it into the pump. Each drain runs at 400 cc's an hour for the first couple hours. And we run it through regular IV 
pumps. And like I said, you can use the Ranger or your heater if you'd like. Qualitatively in the operating room at successive takebacks, there are fewer adhesions, better quality of the bowel mesentery and less mesenteric edema. And that by itself is something that's, that's a win. All right, well, that's direct peritoneal resuscitation. I hope that you enjoyed the video and it could help you in your facility. If you subscribe to complexwounds.com, you'll get every once in a while our new videos sent out to you. And thank you so much for watching and have a great Fistula Fun Friday.